Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, Arbor Network's Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report Unleashed. My name is Bridget Kaplan, and I am the Marketing Manager for Prevalent Security Solutions. Prevalent Security Solutions is a cybersecurity solutions provider with over 13 years of experience. We partner with leading vendors around information security, risk management, and compliance. We also offer a turnkey managed security service for helping organizations with third-party risk. Today we'll be hearing from Gary Sackrider, Principal Security Technologist from Arbor Networks. Gary will be providing an overview of Arbor Networks' 12th Annual Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report. The report is based on a survey of 365 internet service providers, as well as other types of network operators from around the world, and on internet traffic data from November 2015 through October 2016. It provides direct insights from network and security professionals at the world's leading service provider, cloud hosting, and enterprise organizations. Before turning it over to Gary, I wanted to let you know that you will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I will now turn it over to Gary. Thanks, and uh, thanks for everybody that's joined today. So today, as, as you know, we're going to be talking about uh, worldwide infrastructure security and uh, you know the view from actual real-world network operators and, and how they see uh, impacts over the past year is also uh, also making some uh, predictions for the coming year and we'll also combine that with some additional uh, research capabilities that we have that uh, can help reinforce this view or have a better understanding of the state of the traffic out there today so that said, let's just get started and move right along to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So just to give out a highlight, I, I know um, you probably already have a good idea, but I wanted to just uh, mention a couple of, of details about the report. So, of course, we've been doing this uh, report for 12 years, um, and, it, and it's, it's changed over time, right? So the kinds of questions we ask have, have evolved over time. Um, you know, we're getting more and more responses. We're getting a broader audience. Uh, in the early years, we were mostly hearing from service providers. So just to kind of give you a quick snapshot, I think the, the first year that we ever did this report, uh, we had responses from uh, 36 uh, Internet service providers. Um, this year, we have, you know, 10 times uh, roughly that many respondents, and they span not only global service providers, but also uh, large enterprise and, and large web properties as well. So we're getting a much more uh, diverse view of uh, network operators and their, their threat, the, the threats they see, the concerns, and the solutions they bring to bear. So hopefully you'll, you'll find this uh, insightful and helpful in uh, having a better perspective and making some planning decisions for the future. So I'll start right off the bat with um, volumetric uh, DDoS attacks. Clearly, the most impacting uh, network operational uh, security event that you can you can have to deal with is these large-scale DDoS attacks. And you know, as you'll you'll see quickly looking through the data, this is a you know an area of great concern for uh, any large-scale network operator. And so it's something that we track very closely. Um, you'll notice that we have about a 60% increase in the largest attack uh, that we had reported in 2016 over 2015, uh, jumping up to about 800 gigabits per second, which is, you know, obviously a massive attack, which would, would be devastating to anyone uh, having to deal with it. So, uh, but the real story in the volumetric attacks is actually goes well beyond just these, these high-profile, very large attacks. So, uh, when we ask people to talk about the largest attacks they saw. And again, we, we don't ask them to tell to report every attack they see on uh, this specific question, just the largest attack. So we had many reports of very large attacks in the 600 and 500 gigabit per second range. Um, in fact, a third of all respondents reported peak attacks over 100 gigabits per second. Uh, but in talking about the volumetric attacks, there's more than to the story than just the, the, the sheer size of these largest outliers. So, 
you know, over 40% of enterprise government education network operators told us they had attacks that completely exceeded their total internet capacity. Over 60% of data center operators reported the same uh, effect of, of DDoS attacks completely saturating their internet capacity. So when you're talking about these types of networks, obviously uh, that could be uh, impacting not only to you know one application, a service, or customer, but to many. Um, beyond that, if we look a little deeper at the numbers, what we see is that we're not just seeing the largest attacks get bigger, but we're seeing more large attacks. So for an example, uh, we've had a massive increase in attacks over 200 gigabits per second. So um, they, oh, about two and a half times as many attack, uh, uh, respondents reported attacks exceeding 200 gig as they did in the previous year. So it's not just the sheer volume, but the, the, the frequency and the quantity of those very large scale attacks and of course the devastating impact that they can have. Taking a look a little deeper, um, we have yet another source of data that we like to bring into the report. So uh, it's an acronym we use, you'll hear us talk about it, we call it ATLAS, and it, it, you know, it's not a, uh, we don't need to get wrapped up around the name, but basically ATLAS is a, is a global sensor network that Arbor Networks has maintained uh, for well over a decade, and it gives us a real-time view of traffic. So one of the nice things it allows us to do is we take the survey data that we get annually, and then we compare it to our real-time monitoring network, and we can get a good sense of whether, you know, what we're hearing reported jives with what we're actually seeing. And of course it does. So you can see uh, while we didn't um, monitor explicitly that 800 gigabit per, uh, per second attack, uh, which was verified uh, as a legitimate uh, attack, um, we did see a lot of attacks in the, um, you know, five, 600 gigabit per, se per second uh, range. And, and as I mentioned before, we had a huge increase of those over 200 gigabits per second. Um, beyond that, looking a little closer at the data, we now see, um, you know, a significant, uh, about a fifth of all attacks are over a gigabit per second, which is a significant increase over the previous year. And average attack size is now up around almost one gigabit per second, which, you know, compared with these extremely large attacks, may sound small, but when you think about uh, the, the connectivity that the average organization has to the internet, a one gigabit per second attack can be extremely disruptive all by itself. And as we dig a little bit deeper into the data, you'll start to understand why uh, size certainly isn't everything when it comes to DDoS attacks, that these smaller attacks can be every bit as disruptive and completely take properties off the line uh, despite uh, not exceeding the total internet capacity. So let's take a look at the driving factors behind these volumetric attacks first. Uh, really, one of the main driving uh, factors we've seen in recent times, and I'm sure you've, you've heard about this, it's been, you know, in the news a lot lately, is IoT, right, the Internet of Things. So we know that there are many, many devices on the network. In fact, I think it's, uh, it's, it's safe to say, regardless of whose estimates you're using, that there are currently more uh, connected devices on the Internet than there are humans on the planet. So we know that this is already a, a large number of devices and it's growing very rapidly. Uh, depending again on who you ask, projections uh, say that within the next few years will be easily to uh, tens of billions uh, looking into, you know, uh, the next uh, decade uh, will be well beyond that, maybe uh, 50, 70, 100 billion devices on the network. So obviously this problem will continue to escalate. And we know that these devices are generally uh, commodity devices. They're not generally managed and maintained on a regular basis. And so what that means is they're vulnerable targets. Um, now IoT-based uh, attacks and, or building botnets based on IoT is not something that's new. However, it's become much more mainstream due to a couple of different uh, factors and, and some, some botnets that have been built recently. But we can trace uh, early IoT-based attacks all the way back to 2013, leveraging webcams and uh, attacks on entities such as the BBC. Um, we've certainly seen that uh, trend grow over the last couple of years. Uh, we know we've uh, witnessed attacks uh, targeting uh, various uh, other uh, entities 
um, Rio Games were a target. Uh, we know uh, Brian Krebs famously, uh, his website was a target of an IoT botnet. Uh, Dyn DNS obviously was very impactful and uh, made the news because it took out a lot of services like Twitter and uh, Netflix and other other services briefly, while the DNS services went down and those those applications became unreachable. So we know that the the uh, you know, the danger is real and it's increasing on a regular basis. So let's take a little bit deeper look at IoT and specifically at the Mirai uh, source code, which has uh, driven the, the, uh, the impetus to build uh, very large scale botnets and that have been leveraged for multiple attacks. And, and you hear a lot of, of talk in the news about the Mirai botnet, so I wanted to kind of put some uh, definitions around that, help you understand a little bit more what it's about. So. Mirai is actually based on source code that was released last fall. Um, that source code basically made it really easy for someone to build a large-scale botnet. Uh, what it does is it contains information about uh, default passwords and default credentials um, and vulnerabilities of, of various uh, commodity IoT devices, uh, and then has uh, built into the code the ability to scan the network for these devices, then uh, attempt to to authenticate and log into those devices using these known uh, passwords and credentials, and then compromise the device by loading malware, and then further exploit it by going out and uh, infecting more devices. So we wanted to just get a little bit better picture. So we, at the end of last year, we put out some honeypots specifically looking for activity uh, uh, based on you know, what's known about the Mirai code. And what we saw in just a two-week span, we saw over a million login attempts uh, from over 92,000 unique IP addresses. So that was just a small snapshot in time. But to give you an idea of the impact of that, in certain regions, uh, like in uh, Southeast Asia in particular and in, in, in Latin America, we were seeing more than one login attempt per minute against these vulnerable devices. So imagine if you were trying to patch these devices. You have to be really quick, don't you? Because if the compromise attempts are coming at you every 60 seconds, um, you know that becomes a very daunting task to patch and, and, and secure those devices before they're compromised. Just to give you, you know, kind of a better sense of uh, the, the potential that is out there uh, in this threat. But there's actually more driving these large-scale attacks than just the Mirai and the IoT source. So if we roll the clock back a little bit, uh, we can go back all the way to 2013 uh, through 20, uh, to at least the middle of and really the end of uh, 2016 and even into 2017. Um, the largest attacks were generally driven not by IoT-based botnets, but rather by a, uh, an attack technique known as reflection amplification. And what reflection amplification does is it le leverages, um, you know, known uh, vulnerabilities as well as uh, known behavior of various widespread uh, applications and services. So an example would be network time servers or DNS servers, where the attackers are able to send a very small packet uh, request to those devices and then ha have them respond with a very large packet response. So that's the amplification part. The reflection part is where the attackers spoof their own source address or the source address of the bot that is sending the request. Uh, what that does is it means that the, the uh, service in question, DNS server, NTP server, other types of servers, uh, will respond not to the source address but to the spoofed source address, which is indeed actually the victim's address. And that's the reflection part of reflection amplification. So in this way, attackers are able to send a small request to a legitimate server. Uh, it appears to the server to be a legitimate request. The server responds to that source, that spoofed address, which is the victim's address. And so the much larger response goes back. And of course, if you multiply that by tens of thousands of bots making those requests simultaneously, then you get a massive packet flood uh, targeting the victim. So we saw huge, huge uh, leveraging of, of that type of exploit in the last year. And actually, the majority of the very large attacks were, in fact, delivering by this much older uh, exploitation technique of reflection amplification. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the year, with the uh, Mirai source code being released, 
we started to see more adoption of large-scale volumetric attacks using uh, Mirai-based botnets. So uh, looking a little deeper at that, I wanted to give you just a different perspective. I mentioned before we have you know, a combination of, of survey data telling us uh, the types of attacks we see and also our own monitoring. So um, same, same technique, uh, same methodology. I wanted to give you a different perspective looking at the, the data, the telemetry we get from our real-time monitoring system that we call ATLAS. And what you can see here, uh, lots of different uh, protocols being uh, leveraged, uh, you know, different applications being leveraged uh, for this type of exploit, everything from DNS and NTP to uh, SSTP, which is the uh, protocol that's used for universal plug-and-play, think of, you know, uh, again, IoT devices. Uh, and other other applications as well. And what you see is not just that we're seeing very large attacks, uh, but also um, the average attacks are getting uh, larger as well. And of course, we're seeing a, a very frequent use of this attack technique. So uh, it, it just gives you a you know a good idea of exactly how these uh, attack vectors are being leveraged and uh, you know for for real world attacks that are that are being monitored. Um, across the globe every day. The next I wanted to talk a little bit about the complexity of attacks. So uh, we started talking out about uh, volumetric attacks. Well, that's only actually one type of DDoS attack. So other types in broad categories, uh, we kind of break it down into three buckets. The volumetric, the most well-known, uh, the, the most um, uh, generates the most traffic. After that, we have state exhaustion and application layer attacks. So I'll take a second to explain the nuance of those. State exhaustion attacks, what they do is they use a, a TCP request to fill up uh, a TCP state table. So if you think any device on your network that's performing, performing a proxy function, like a firewall or a load balancer, which basically you know, takes in a TCP request, um, obviously doesn't expose uh, internal IP addresses, so it takes that request. It puts it in a state table, and then it forwards that request on to the internal device, and it maintains the state of that connection. Um, well, there are uh, attack vectors called state exhaustion attacks, which are designed specifically to compromise those types of security devices that um, are performing proxy services and maintaining state tables. So the attack simply sends massive numbers of TCP connection requests without ever waiting for a response. Every request goes in the state table, and eventually the state table fills up, the device can't take any more requests, and therefore service is denied. Looking a little uh, beyond that at application layer attacks, again, a different attack vector. Application layer attacks are almost the opposite in a, from a DDoS perspective of these volumetric attacks. They don't attempt to do packet floods. They don't uh, generally fill up the, the internet uh, capacity, so they're not re uh, ex exhausting bandwidth resources but rather they're exhausting application and server resources. So we often refer to these as kind of a low and slow or stealthy DDoS attacks. They're much harder to detect. As I said, they don't fill up the pipe, so it's not as obvious. But nevertheless, they have the same impact because they, they exhaust the resources of the applications and the servers themselves. Um, as you can see here, uh, we see a pretty good mix of both application state exhaustion and uh, volumetric attacks. When you look at the two graphs, these are two perspectives of two different types of network operators. So service providers, as you would expect, see more volumetric attacks. Enterprise government application, uh, sorry, enterprise government education network operators in the graph on the right um, still see a lot of volumetric attacks, but they're seeing more application layer attacks. And that's to be expected because the application layer attacks, as I mentioned, are stealthy. They're harder to uh, identify at a macro level. And generally speaking, it's more desirable to deal with and mitigate those attacks closer to the applications and services themselves where you have better visibility and a better understanding of the traffic that, that is expected to be on those networks and uh, what types of uh, services and applications you're operating. So uh, regardless of the sort of breakout of the percentage of, of attack types that each network operator sees, uh, when asked about whether they saw any application layer attacks at all, 95% um, of service providers said they saw at least some application layer attacks on networks. So we know that that uh, technique is, is growing in popularity. 
Um, looking at um, multi-vector attacks, uh, we're seeing a huge increase that as well. So multi-vector attack is where these different attack technologies or attack methodologies are combined into a single campaign. So you think volumetric attacks, state exhaustion attacks, and application layer attacks all coming at a target simultaneously. Uh, the reason they do this, of course, is because it increases complexity and it makes the attacks harder to defend, right? So the most obvious one, the one you're going to notice first, is the volumetric attack. Um, so, you know, when that attack happens and there's mitigation capability put into play, uh, you know, immediately you're going to mitigate the volumetric attack, but as soon as you do that and you realize the service, you know, has, isn't restored yet, um, then you, you know, you start taking a deeper look and you see, oh, there's also a state exhaustion attack. There's also an application layer attack. And of course, uh, the way these attacks go in the real world is they don't just send you one of each and, and, and then wait for you to mitigate it and then go home. They're constantly varying. Right. So as soon as one type of attack is mitigated, the attacker will attempt to send a different type of attack, maybe a different uh, type of packet flood or a different type of application layer attack. And so that's where we see the complexity in the attacks and in the mitigation increasing over time. And uh, no surprise that uh, as those capabilities become more understood and uh, more easily available for attackers to carry out, uh, they're going to leverage those capabilities and, and try to get around the defenses as best they can. So let's take a look at, at the types of services that are targeted in these attacks. Um, again, looking specifically at the applications, we see that the vast majority of attacks are, type, are targeting web services. And that's really no surprise, as we see more and more applications and servers moving to uh, web-based infrastructure, it's no surprise that that's where the attacks are, are going to target. But as you can see, uh, the most targeted uh, attacks are going to be around uh, DNS and HTTP. Um, no surprise to either to find um, that we see service providers are, are, you know, calling out DNS as with a, just a slight edge over web services uh, for the, the top attack vector, whereas uh, we see the reverse being web traffic being the most common attack followed closely by, by DNS or enterprise government education. Again, this makes sense. Uh, service providers are running a lot of those uh, DNS servers. Uh, there's a lot more DNS servers, uh, DNS uh, traffic traversing their network than the typical enterprise network. So it makes sense that they would see more of those. Uh, but of course, we're seeing an increase. And beyond that, we're seeing uh, an increase in encrypted web traffic attacks. So there's a lot of reasons why an attacker might want to encrypt the attack traffic. Um, first of all and foremost is to get a path through uh, security devices, right? So if you have a, a firewall that's proxying traffic and it sees secured web traffic going to a server that's supposed to be serving secured web traffic, well, that looks normal and that's going to get a path through that security device as it should. And so attackers will often use that encryption as a way to get a free path through a security device. Uh, but beyond that, we see uh, more complicated uh, problems arise where um, things like perfect uh, for uh, secrecy or PFS uh, can create uh, challenges for uh, securing this traffic, right? So in a PFS scenario, you have to have, um, a, a, you know, a, a full bi-directional view of the traffic in order to uh, be able to decrypt it and then look inside the packets and then, uh, to be able to understand whether there's attack traffic there. So it can make uh, while it's still possible to defend against these uh, types of attacks, it makes uh, those defenses more difficult and more expensive. So next I want to talk about the frequency of attacks. Uh, so as I mentioned, I think I mentioned early on, we see sort of three trends in, at a macro level, which is increasing volume, increasing uh, complexity, and increasing frequency. So I wanted to talk uh, next about the frequency. As you can see, um, we are seeing across the board increased frequency regardless of the attack targets. So whether we talk to service router network operators, enterprise government education network operators, or data center operators, they're all telling us they're seeing increased frequency of DDoS attacks. So more attacks per month, more attacks uh, per day, per year, et cetera. Um, as you can see, it's up for data centers, it's up for enterprise, it's up for service routers. Now, of course, as you would expect, um, service providers are going to see the largest volume. They're operating the largest network. They have the most uh, entities traffic traversing their networks. And then you would expect, right, 
uh, data centers would be next in line, followed by typical uh, enterprise government or education networks. Um, I mentioned a couple times our, our Atlas real-time monitoring uh, system that's uh, you know global sensor net. We're seeing over 135,000 uh, volumetric attacks alone every single week. So uh, you know that that gives you a, a gauge for you know just how many uh, what attacks are happening on a daily basis and you know what that frequency really looks like. So next, I wanted to transition into talking a little bit about uh, DDoS motivation. Uh, again, we this is something that we track every single year, try to get an understanding of what's driving these attacks. Um, as you can see, um, it depends on who you ask a little bit. Now, the graph I'm showing you here is based on responses from uh, service provider network operators. And you can see this past year, their number one cited motivation was online gaming related. And that might be a little bit of a surprise, but when you sort of take a step back and look at, you know, the attacks that we've seen in, in uh, the last year, it makes a little more sense. Now, not to be discounted, obviously there's lots of other motivations for DDoS attacks. So from a service provider perspective, um, you know, beyond the gaming related, we see a lot of attacks driven by uh, ideological or political motivations. And then beyond that, uh, the next largest block is going to be criminal, criminally driven activities, right? So whether it's demonstrating attack capabilities, whether it's rivalries between criminal groups, could be extortion, uh, competitive takeout, et cetera. Um, now, the graph would look different if I, if I showed you just the, the enterprise government and educational uh, responses where they see um, ideological and, uh, and criminal extortion as the top motivation. And you might wonder why the difference in perspective between service provider and enterprise. And that's really simple. Uh, enterprises generally don't have a lot of gaming-related traffic traversing their networks unless, of course, that happens to be their business that they're in. Uh, on the other hand, uh, service providers will see that traffic. And what we've seen in a trend over recent years, I'm sure you remember there have been some high-profile events like Lizard Squad and Lizard Stress Stressor Botnet um, taking out gaming networks. Uh, sometimes this is done... Uh, in fact, it happened, you know, you probably remember the incident where that happened over Christmas and a lot of people were very disappointed that their new game boxes uh, couldn't, you know, connect online um, over the holidays. Well, high profile of, of events like that generate a lot of uh, attention. And in fact, uh, using the example of, of Lizard Squad, you know, they took out gaming networks over Christmas and then one week later they announced their DDoS for hire service. Uh, after they've gotten all that free publicity. So you can sort of see how that motivation plays out. Um, the other thing that we're seeing more and more is uh, attackers are using DDoS as a way to gain competitive advantage in games. So as I'm sure you're aware, gaming is, is not just, uh, you know, a recreational activity. It's also big business. Uh, there are also, uh, there's also competitive gaming where people actually, you know, uh, they play games for a living. Uh, there's gaming as a spectator sport now. And in those cases, uh, we, we're seeing more and more where uh, DDoS uh, attacks are being carried out to gain competitive advantage in the gaming environment. So I think the key takeaway here is many, many uh, motivations for DDoS attacks, uh, no shortage of those. While the top motivations vary year to year, uh, there are so many of them, uh, it's sort of understandable why we continue to see this proliferation of uh, both the frequency and the uh, sheer volume of DDoS attacks. So next, next let's take a look at, at the targets. What, what is the, you know, what are the, the top targets for uh, DDoS attacks? Well, from the service provider perspective, the, the vast majority of the attacks are transiting the network and they're targeting end users. In other words, they're no longer targeting the service provider infrastructure. Uh, in the early days of DDoS attacks, we saw that Almost all of DDoS attacks were actually targeting service provider infrastructure. It makes sense when you think about the nature of those attacks. The goal is to saturate internet connectivity and therefore deny service. And in the early days, the simplest way to do that was to take out circuits, right? If you, if you fill up the service provider's pipe, then everybody downstream is denied service. So uh, there were lots of attacks, uh, you know, going back 10, 15 years targeting service provider infrastructure. Well, no great surprise, service providers have done a really good job of securing their own networks, of securing their infrastructure, of making sure 
the networks are resilient and can uh, continue to operate and withstand these types of attacks. So attackers obviously have moved on to targeting uh, beyond the service provider infrastructure and targeting, uh, you know, the actual end targets directly. So whether that be, uh, you know, uh, enterprise, government, education. And you can see here, you know, we've had uh, finance and hosting are, are clearly uh, top targets. Uh, we see from an inter, uh, enterprise uh, perspective looking closer into that. We've seen an increase in both uh, finance uh, being targeted as well as government entities being targeted. But, uh, you know, lots of other entities being targeted as well. Um, E-commerce, utilities, healthcare, uh, manufacturing, pretty much across the board, everyone's target. So next I want to take a look at the impact and specifically looking at how it's affecting enterprise op network operators. As you can see, uh, the number one uh, cited uh, impact to those businesses is reputation or brand damage. So, you know, when, a, when an attack happens and a property goes offline and service is interrupted, obviously, you know, that's a black mark and people take note, especially if it's highly publicized. Uh, beyond that, though, we see almost on par with reputation and brand damage is operational expense. And then many other uh, expenses beyond that. So it gets, you know, it could be, be as, as severe as uh, causing fluctuations in the stock price. Uh, we see, you know, extortion requ requests. Uh, we see obviously a big drain uh, in, uh, you know, demand on the infrastructure, on uh, the employees, on the IT and the specialized security. We've seen. Uh, uh, even, you know, executives, uh, even at, at the sea level, losing their jobs over these attacks in some cases. So the impacts can be quite severe. Um, looking just across the enterprise, government, and education uh, organizations, the estimated down cost is, the average is over $500 per minute. Um, and when we look at a major attack, we see, you know, estimates ranging from $10,000 up to well over a million dollars. So we know that the impact to the enterprise can be quite quite, uh, quite re real and quite uh, expensive. So next, let's take a look at the data center. So data centers obviously are, are prime targets for these types of attacks uh, for lots of different reasons, and not the least of which is uh, most data centers tend to host many, you know, tens of, of thousands of properties inside of them. And so, uh, you know, uh, attacking a data center uh, can take out a lot more than just one entity. Um, it could be targeting the data center operator themselves. It could be for the purpose of extortion. It could be targeting entities within the data center. And in fact, we even see attacks that are intra-data center, where one entity within a data center is, ta is attacking another entity within the data center. Um, so, uh, of course, the cost of that can be quite high. Operational expense uh, cited by the, as the number one uh, cost by data center operators, uh, which is far and away the, the most impact. Uh, but they also cite revenue loss, customer churn, employee stock, uh, employee turnover, and, and stock price fluctuation. So as you can see, um, the impacts in the data center can be quite severe as well. So. Let's, uh, beyond all the um, sort of the bad news and the doom and gloom, um, I wanted to also give you some good statistics around what people are doing about it and some success stories and how things are improving and getting better. So as I mentioned briefly a minute ago, service providers have been dealing with these attacks longer than any other uh, network operator. So they're the most seasoned, they're the most prepared, uh, they, they have the best defenses in place. Um, you know, they, they, they understand how to handle this threat. So, um, as you might expect, uh, they're continuing to impress us with how well they're dealing with it uh, by improving yet again year over year on, uh, you know, the defenses they put in place and, and, and how they go about stopping these attacks. So, if we look at the top three techniques, uh, mitigation techniques that service providers are deploying, um, these are all uh, stateless defense uh, solutions that are quite effective at stopping DDoS attacks. And so uh, what we see really the key takeaway here is they're bringing to bear the most effective technologies the most often, and that's why they're having success. And when we look at uh, how we measure this, that success, 
uh, one of the metrics we take into account is how quickly they can mitigate an attack. And so when we're look, looking at those numbers, uh, we see that, you know, over three quarters of service providers are able to mitigate attacks in 20 minutes or less. And in fact, 27% of service providers tell us that they are mitigating attacks automatically, so essentially in real time, right? So that's a fantastic result. Um, we, we see that uh, trend line growing year over year. And it says that, you know, service providers understand the threat and are doing the right things uh, to, to put a stop to these to mitigate the threat and improving on their defenses year over year. Um, the other interesting metric uh, around this is demand uh, from customers for dealing with these types of threats. So service providers tell us that they're seeing, uh, you know, overwhelming majority of them are seeing increased demand for uh, mitigation and defensive uh, solutions and services that they provide. And that that's um, being driven, uh, you know, across the board, but certainly uh, in no small part by government, finance, e-commerce, and hosting operators who are their customers. So let's next take a look at how data center operators are dealing with these attacks and kinds of mitigations they're putting in place. So again, uh, we see that data center operators are, are, you know, dealing with more of these attacks. Uh, they've been dealing with them a bit longer, so their uh, their defenses are tend to be, um, you know, a bit better than the enterprise. Maybe not quite necessarily at the same level on par with their service provider or peers, but uh, again, that sort of depends on the on the operator. Uh, but again, great news. We see improvements across the board. We see again they're using these, um, you know, not only using purpose-built uh, solutions to deal with these attacks, but they're also using the best practice recommended uh, layered uh, uh, defenses. Uh, so we, you know, we like what we see here. Um, you know, they're, they're using all the tools in the arsenal, but they're prioritizing the most effective tools. So um, another one that we call out here specifically uh, is the use of firewalls. We've seen a huge reduction in that. Um, why is the use of firewalls less or reduction in use of firewalls is a good thing. Well, you keep in mind that we're talking specifically about using them to defend against DDoS attacks. So it's not that we encourage people to stop using firewalls, uh, quite to the contrary, but rather we encourage people to use the right tool for the right uh, attack vector. And as I mentioned before, uh, firewalls, due to the, their stateful nature, can be susceptible to some types of these attacks. And so. Um, actually, what you really want is to have the firewall in place, but have it protected by a purpose-built DDoS mitigation appliance. And that's exactly what uh, more and more uh, data center operators are telling us they're doing. So that's a good thing. Uh, so next I wanted to talk about the enterprise government education network operators and what they're doing. So obviously they're, the, they're sort of the last mile. They're uh, least experienced in dealing with these types of attacks. Uh, we are seeing some improvements. Uh, you'll notice that uh, when we look at the technologies brought to bear, uh, not surprising that they tend more frequently to bring uh, traditional uh, security type solutions to bear against these attacks, and they're less likely to have uh, dedicated or purpose-built devices for dealing with DDoS attacks. However, uh, the use of those types of, of dedicated and purpose-built solutions is increasing. They are increasing the use of, of outsourced or cloud-based mitigation as well as layered and hybrid protection. So seeing those increase is good. Um, so while they're still leaning heavily on these traditional security appliances, they're slowly weaning themselves off of those for this type of defense and ramping up the use of more uh, purpose-built and uh, more appropriate solutions to bring to bear. So we are seeing improvement, and that's absolutely a good thing. So next, I just wanted to highlight quickly just a few stats on IPv6. Um, a couple things happening here. Um, first of all, we were quite surprised actually to see IPv6 uh, visibility for service providers going down a bit over the previous year. Uh, now, there could be multiple factors driving that. Um, one certainly wouldn't be surprising is the increased deployment and utilization of IPv6. So, um, while the predicted growth rates for IPv6 traffic continue to be very conservative, the actual growth rates are outstripping the predictions. And so um, that would uh, probably help explain why the visibility is down. If you're 
not planning for that growth and then it's it's, it's happening um, then you may not have you know the budget or the resources to get that visibility uh, on those networks if you were forced to grow them a little faster than you were planning um, looking at IPv6 there are some specific security concerns around rolling out IPv6 networks that we like to ask about that um, as you can see uh, across the board uh, people are worried about uh, traffic floods and DDoS when it comes to IPv6. Uh, that's not surprising at all because when you uh, exponentially increase the number of addressable uh, IP endpoints out there, then you also exponentially increase the number of compromisable hosts. Um, so it makes sense that that would be a concern. Uh, beyond that, there's concerns around uh, misconfiguration, or uh, lack of feature parity in some cases, you know, security uh, solutions that are in place for IPv4 may not be fully available in the IPv6 world. Um, as you can see, lack of visibility is also clearly uh, stated as a concern. So understanding, you know, the challenges that IPv6 brings, uh, like any new technology, it brings both opportunity and challenge. So it's just good to know uh, where we stand. So the last topic I wanted to cover was around organizational security, kind of, you know, what types of things that uh, network operators are doing and, and uh, how they're having successes with those. So um, we're seeing some good results here. Um, about half of uh, service providers now tell us they implement anti-spoofing filters, which can stop those reflection amplification attacks from traversing their network, and that's a good thing. Uh, we see an increase in uh, simulations or drills of practicing for these types of attacks. Um, so we're seeing that up significantly, not just for service providers, but for enterprise and government network operators as well. And we think this is really a, a, a key issue, um, you know, not just having good personnel, but making sure that those personnel are constantly trained and uh, up to date and dealing with the latest tools and techniques uh, available to them to mitigate these, to identify and mitigate these attacks. Uh, like anything else, you don't want to be learning on the job when it comes to defending against a malicious attack. So uh, the more that you can uh, practice and have drills and simulations, uh, the better prepared you're going to be to, be to uh, defend these attacks in real time. So last uh, slide I want to give you here is just some demographics. Uh, you know, we, we made it clear early on that this report is uh, largely based on, on survey data, although we also include other uh, in, intelligence uh, feeds that we have and other observations and real-time monitoring that we have. But talking about the uh, survey itself, just to give you an idea of the demographics, it's uh, about uh, two-thirds uh, service rider, one-third enterprise, roughly. Um, you can see that uh, the majority uh, Sixty-three percent of our respondents are either network or security uh, professionals. So these are the people in the trenches actually operating these uh, these networks and these uh, security solutions. So we know we're we're targeting the right people to get the information. Um, as you can see in the SP, that breaks out into a pretty good mix of uh, tier one, tier two, and three operators, uh, and then other types of operators such as data center, MSSP, et cetera. Uh, in the enterprise government education, we break down to uh, oh, not just shy of 60% enterprise, 26% education, and, uh, and then the remainder of uh, government network operators. Within the enterprise category, uh, we had a big increase in responses from banking and finance, as well as uh, technology, um, uh, transportation, and manufacturing, also very well represented. And the geographic split kind of spans the globe. You see we have a good range around North America, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. So that concludes the presentation. I'd like to uh, open it up now for any questions that anyone has. Hopefully we have uh, a few questions and we'll, we'll take those now. Great, yeah, thank you, Gary. Uh, there were three questions that were submitted. The first one is, I already spend a lot of time on perimeter security defenses won't they protect me during DDoS attacks? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, um, you know, we certainly uh, believe in a layered defense strategy. So, perimeter defenses are an important component of that. However, um, many traditional uh, perimeter defenses, as we we talked about earlier, 
aren't necessarily up to the job of, of stopping all of the types of, of um, DDoS attacks. So uh, while they may be able to stop some attacks, um, certain types of attacks, uh, they, they're not a comprehensive solution. And in fact, in some cases, there are specific attacks that are crafted to defeat those devices. So um, what I would say is you, you need to augment those solutions and those uh, devices with something that is uh, explicitly designed to deal with this type of attack, whether that be uh, cloud-based uh, or upstream service provider-based mitigation or augmenting your own on-premise solutions. Great. The second question is, if DDoS attacks are designed to saturate inter con uh, internet connectivity, why should I try to stop them? Isn't that the internet provider's problem? Right. Well, that is that is a good point. Um, so uh, that really applies to the volumetric DDoS attacks that we've been talking about. And of course, absolutely, if it's, a, if it's an attack that saturates your internet connectivity, it's got to be dealt with somewhere upstream. But as we as we mentioned earlier, there are, there are attacks, in particular the application layer attacks uh, that are low and slow, defined, uh, designed to fly under the radar. And what you really want is something uh, that's much closer, you know, an on-prem device either in the data center or on your network that's closer to the application and services uh, that can be specifically looking at the application layer for these types of attacks, give you that early warning, allow you to defend against them as quickly as possible, and then also be able to intelligently signal upstream if they are overwhelmed by a volumetric attack. So that's going to give you, you know, an always-on solution with the ability to see, you know, through all seven layers to find those application layer attacks, and it's going to give you the most complete solution. Great. And then the last question is, IoT devices are clearly a security threat, but what can I do about it? Uh, that's a great, great question. So, I mean, as we know, you know, IoT devices are, are there's billions of them out there. Um, you know, they're not. Uh, sometimes they're they're insecure right out of the box. And uh, so, you know, the question is, yeah, what can what can you do about it? So, it turns out there are quite a bit of things, there are quite a few things that you can do. So, you know, first and foremost, if you have the the capacity, if you you know, if you have the knowledge, the skills, and you, the resources. Uh, you want to try and secure those devices, right? So any IoT devices that you're operating on your network, um, you want to go and check, find out if they're running default passwords, make sure that those credentials have been updated, um, you know, close off any unnecessary services and applications that they're running, um, uh, you know, and even if you don't have that level of expertise, a much simpler method might be just make sure they're not on the connected to the public internet, right? So, you know, you can put those types of devices, IoT devices, on your private network, but not give them access to the to the internet. Um, in in many cases, people, you know, just don't think about that, and uh, then they're, they're not thinking about the vulnerabilities or the potential for for uh, misuse. So, something as simple as, as as moving them to a private network or making sure they don't have access to the public network. Uh, can be, make a, a huge difference. And then uh, beyond that, I would say, you know, you can certainly, um, you know, be an advocate, right? So, you know, if you have, uh, if you're a consumer of uh, IoT devices, whether you be in a corporate entity, and you know, enterprise, government, or uh, even a uh, home user consumer, you know, make, you know, let your manufacturers know that you care about security and that's important to you, that you want them to patch the devices, that you want them to provide secure devices. So, you know, providing that pressure on uh, the manufacturers of the devices to make sure that they're doing the right thing it can certainly uh, be a part of the solution. Great. Well, thank you, Gary, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, you can contact me, Bridget Kaplan, at bkaplan at prevalencesecurity.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Prevalent Security Solutions and Arbor Networks, thank you guys for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.